Good evening, everyone. It's great to see you all gathered, and uh, I won't uh, fool myself in thinking you're all here to hear me. Uh, I know there's another part of our service that is, uh, we eagerly look forward to being together as a community to celebrate the gift of baptism. So for those who don't know me, I'm Bart Kiefer. I have the privilege of serving at Maranatha Reformed Church in Waynefleet, and again, it's my joy to be with you this evening. So as we begin, we're reminded um, from Psalm 124, the call to worship, but also um, the reason why we worship. And it simply says there, our help is in the name of the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. And we come this evening to worship the one who is the creator, the sustainer and the provider for us. So as we worship, I invite you to stand, receive God's greeting. As we worship this evening, may the love of God and the grace of his son, Jesus Christ, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be and abide with us all. Amen. Let's sing together now, Open Our Eyes, Lord. Lord, we come before you this evening to worship, and we ask that you would fill our worship with grace, that every thought, word, and deed may be acceptable to you, to you, the one who is our rock and our redeemer. Amen. And I don't know if we continue standing or not, but if, uh, if that's the case, we will continue to sing, and we'll be singing Amazing Grace.
now have the, offer, uh, the opportunity to uh, worship through this evening's offering. And again, it's for the ministries here at Bethel and also for Haldeman Pregnancy Center. I invite the deacons to come. Thank you, Pastor Bert, for allowing us to share the pulpit this morning and this evening and uh, uh, have this opportunity to share in a celebration with uh, Alex and Laney and Blefa. And uh, at this time, Alex, Laney, if you want to come and join me in the front here uh, as they make their way forward. Um, the last time I would have seen Alex and Laney sitting in the front together would have been uh, June of 2015 uh, when, no, just on, the, just on the pew, just have a seat, relax, it's all good, and uh, as an option of their, opportunity of their marriage, and, uh, and we had a lovely day, I believe it was warm that day as well, and uh, uh, Alex is almost as nervous now as he was then, but it's okay, we're relaxed, we're fine, and uh, uh, it, was a, it was an opportunity to, to share together, and I remember uh, their passage was on Ruth, and, uh, and uh, the, the, the idea of I will follow, and of course, in physical terms, as they returned to Tahiti, that was ex exactly what happened in their marriage life as they agreed to follow. And so uh, we have an opportunity to, to gather together to uh, witness the celebration of uh, the young daughter, and uh, I'll uh, lead us through the reading of the form, and uh, at the appropriate time, Alex Lane, I'll just ask you to stand and answer a couple of questions. Let us hear the Lord's command concerning the sacrament of holy baptism. After he had risen victorious from the grave, Jesus said to his disciples, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, Go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. 
and surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. In obedience to this command, the church baptizes believers and their children. Let us hear the promises of God which are confirmed in baptism. The Lord made this great promise to Abraham. I will establish my covenant as an everlasting covenant between you and me and you and your descendants after you for generations to come. To be your God and the God of your descendants after you. In the fullness of time, God came in Jesus Christ to give pardon and peace through the blood of the cross and the blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. After Jesus had risen from the dead, the apostles proclaimed, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. And you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The promise is for you and for your children and all who are far off, all whom the Lord our God will call. Anticipating the fulfillment of God's promise, Paul assures us, if we died with him, we will also live with him. If we endure, we will also reign with him. These are the unfailing promises of our Lord to those who are baptized. Let us also recall the teaching of Scripture concerning the sacrament of baptism. The water of baptism signifies the washing away of our blood, of our sin by the blood of Jesus Christ, and the renewal of our lives by the Holy Spirit. It also signifies that we are buried with Christ. From this we learn that our sin has been condemned by God and that we are to hate it and consider ourselves as having died to it. Moreover, this water of baptism signifies that we are raised with Christ. From this we learn that we are to walk with him in newness of life. All this tells us that God has adopted us as his children. Now if we are children, then we are heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ. Thus, in baptism, God seals the promises that he gave when he made his covenant with us, calling us and our children to put our trust for life and death in Christ our Savior, to deny ourselves, to take up our cross, and to follow him in obedience and love. God graciously includes our children in his covenant, and his promises are for them as well as for us. God, Jesus himself embraced little children and blessed them, the Apostle Paul said that children of believers are holy. Just as the children of the old covenant received the sign of circumcision, our children are given the sign of baptism. We are therefore always to teach our little ones that they have been set apart by baptism as God's own children. Let's join our hearts in prayer together. Father in heaven, we pray that you will never destroy us in our sin as with the flood. But save us as you saved believing Noah and his family, and spare us as you spared the Israelite who walked safely through the sea. We pray that Christ, who went down into the Jordan and came up to receive the Spirit, who sank deep into death and was raised up Lord of life, will always keep us and our little ones in the grip of his hand. We pray, O Holy Father, that your Spirit will, will separate us from sin and openly mark us with a faith that can stand the light of day and endure the dark of night. Prepare us now, O Lord, to respond with glad hope to your promises so that we and all entrusted in your care may drink deeply from the well of living water. We pray in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. At this time, uh, Alex and Laney, just stand where you are. And I have a, a number of questions that I'll ask. I'll read uh, all three questions and then ask for your response at the end. Alex and Laney, since you have presented Lefa Teresa for holy baptism, you are asked to fall, answer the following questions between God and his people. First, do you confess Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, accept the promises of God, and affirm the truth of the Christian faith which is proclaimed in the Bible and confessed in this church of Christ? Second, do you believe that Lepha, though sinful by nature, is received by God in Christ as a member of his covenant and therefore ought to be baptized? And third, do you promise in reliance on the Holy Spirit and the help of the Christian community to do all in your power to instruct her in the Christian faith and to lead her by your example to be Christ's disciple? Alex and Laney, what is your answer? Amen. 
And I invite the congregation to stand with this young family. And even as we are common to, to answer these questions, and yet the reality that Alex and Lainey next week Saturday are going to be going back to Tahiti. And you might ask yourself, how can I in good conscience agree to raise a child who I will never maybe see again for another three years? And the reality of that is as the broader church of Christ, we answer those questions together, acknowledging that the Spirit leads Alex and Laney, and through our prayers for them and for her, uh, we will help them to raise Lepha in the knowledge of who Jesus Christ is. And so do you, people of the Lord, promise to receive Lepha in love, to pray for her, instruct her in the faith, and encourage and sustain her in the fellowship of believers? What is your answer? We do, God help us. Amen. The Lord said, let the children, little children come to me and do not hinder them, for as such belongs the kingdom of God. I invite Alex Laney Lefa to come forward. And you may be seated. Thank you. Come on right up. Nice and tall. Hi, Lef. So what's going on? Lefa, Teresa, Wanda Vanunen, I baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let's have a time of prayer together. Father, you know this young lady. She is your daughter, as well as the daughter of Alex and Laney and, and related to others here today. But we know you have a special place in your heart for her, and we pray that as she walks through her life, as she uh, deals with the challenges of life, deals with the joys and the sorrows, that you will be a constant companion to her, that you will lift her up, that you will give her everything that she stands in need of. Be with Alex and Laney as they provide the day-to-day -day care for her and that they will enable her to come to know you in a real way. And we know that your spirit is not bound by four walls, by oceans or land. And we know that there's no time barrier for your spirit to infuse each one of us, whether we're here in the sanctuary or watching online from wherever this is seen, that your spirit can bind us together with bonds that can never be broken. And Lord, we thank you for the way in which you lead us and guide us in all we do. In your name we pray. Amen. Congratulations. Alex, congratulations. At this time, I'll invite you to stand, and we will join in song, Baptized in Water, after which we will invite Pastor Bart back to join with us.
invite you to join me at this time in the book of Luke. Someone commented to me, oh, an Easter message. And after some of the things that we just sang, I feel completely justified in singing about that, or singing of preaching about that. But it's not uh, the, the resurrection account itself, but you'll see there that it's the uh, next portion that follows the, uh, on the road to Emmaus, Jesus' conversation with the two disciples. So uh, I don't often begin by reading the word, but this evening I will. So there in Luke chapter 24, we'll begin at verse 13. Now that same day, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. They were talking with each other about everything that had happened. As they talked and discussed these things with each other, Jesus himself came up and walked along with them, but they were kept from recognizing him. He asked them, what are you discussing together as you walk along? They stood still, their faces downcast. One of them, named Cleopas, asked him, Are you the only one living in Jerusalem who doesn't know these things that have happened there in these days? What things, he asked. About Jesus of Nazareth, they replied. He was a prophet, powerful in word and deed before God and all the people. The chief priests and our rulers handed him over to be sentenced to death, and they crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one who is going to redeem Israel. And what is more, it is the third day since all this took place. In addition, some of our women amazed us. They went to the tomb early this morning, but didn't find his body. They came and told us what, that they had seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. Then some of our companions went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but him they did not see. He said to them, how foolish you are. How slow of heart to believe all that the prophets had spoken. Did not Christ have to suffer these things and then enter his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them what was what pardon me, explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. As they approached the village to which they were going, Jesus acted as if he were going farther. But they urged him strongly, Stay with us, for it is nearly evening. The day is almost over. So he went in to stay with them. When he was at the table with them, he took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and began to give it to them. Then their eyes were opened and they recognized him, and he disappeared from their sight. They asked each other, were not our hearts burning within us while they talked with us on the road and opened the scriptures to us? They got up and returned at once to Jerusalem. There they found the eleven and those with them assembled together and saying, It is true, the Lord has risen and has appeared to Simon. Then the two told what had happened on the way and how Jesus was recognized by them when he broke the bread. And we say, the word of God, for which we say, thanks be to him. Let's take a moment and pray. Lord God, as we look to your word this evening, the prayer of our hearts is that the words of your servant's mouth and the meditation of our hearts would be pleasing in your sight, and you who is our rock and our redeemer. And we pray this through Christ our Lord. Amen. So on that dark Friday afternoon, Jesus cried out in triumph and breathed his last. But those who were gathered there didn't recognize the victory that took place. The hope they had was now gone. I love a phrase I read in preparing the message. One author said, The icy fingers of death tightened around their hearts in chilling and numbing grief. So they hastily prepared the body and laid it in the tomb. And then on Sunday, the the text tells us before this that the ladies returned to the tomb to finalize the care of the body, but found it empty. And even the angelic proclamation, after the angel angels pronounced his resurrection, there was still an element of disbelief. In fact, what comes before the text we just read, it talks about the fact that Peter went and he wondered to himself what had happened. Another translation says, he went home marveling 
at what had happened. So what took place? Our text begins with a conversation while we find two individuals on the road to Emmaus. And it's interesting that uh, as I uh, preached these three sections recently at Maranatha, each of the three sections sort of follows a pattern. It starts with confusion, followed by instruction, and ending with witness. And so in this case, the confusion that begins revolves around what took place and these individuals walking on their way home, away home from uh, Jerusalem to Emmaus. And the text tells us there were two people and identifies later one of those two people as Cleopas. And some scholars think that it's possible that this Cleopas is the same individual as referred to in John chapter 19, verse 25, which there is identified as Clopas. And if that happens to be the case, then it would be Jesus' uncle, Joseph's brother. And then most likely the individual that would have been with him would have been his wife. But regardless of whether you side with that or side with the side that we don't necessarily know exactly who this individual is, the bottom line reality is that they are said to be disciples, followers of Jesus. And as such, they had put their hope in him for their deliverance. And so the result is, at this point in time, they're devastated. They're devastated because what they had hoped for didn't come to pass. And so in a sense, in a very real sense, they needed a word from God. And I think with a, a statement like that, it's always one of those times I, I like to say it's a good spot to stop and ponder. And in this case, stop and ponder the beauty of our Lord. He knew the reality of what was going on in their hearts at that place and time. He only, not only knew the geographic location, the physical location of these two individuals, but he knew the terrain of their hearts right then and there, did he not? And see, again, pause and ponder because that's the beautiful reality for us as well. He knows us. That's, of course, that all-knowing quality or characteristic of God. We like to give the big name omniscience, right? Right? But it's more than simply knowing and head knowledge, knowing. It's also knowing us personally and it's knowing us intimately. Much like the psalmist says in Psalm 139, verses 2 and 3, where he writes, You know when I sit down and when I rise. You perceive my thoughts from afar. You discern my going out and my lying down. You are familiar with all my ways. This idea of knowing is something that has been emphasized in a, in, a, in a teaching, a DVD study that we do in our adult Sunday school. I don't know if many of you are familiar with something called That the World May Know. It's um, Ray Vanderlaan is the teacher in it, and it's very much contextualizes the word. He teaches from locations um, where these things actually could have or did take place, and it gives you a, a wonderful picture. But in his teaching about the Israelites' exodus when they're leaving from Egypt, he says there was a no, they, they knew God, sort of head knowledge, but the part is that he wanted them to truly know him through experience. And so there was that journey that they took when uh, it ended up being 40 years. But it's that knowing, our call to know him, but the assurance we have that he knows us. He, he, he knows us and he loves us. And in fact, I would say he knows, uh, he loves us despite the fact that he knows us, right? So in knowing where they were in our text, Jesus came to them. Another wonderful picture, a reminder of the fact that he pursues us. Even in our struggles, he continues to come to us. Again, sometimes that mean, might mean we need to do something, and again, he continues to come to us through the word. Sometimes we need to open the Bible. Well, we, we all, not sometimes. We need to open the Bible and allow him to speak to us his truth and uh, encourage us and direct us. But he continually communicates with us. 
And so that's what happens here. In this beginning interchange, there's a conversation begins. And it begins with a simple question from Jesus. He asks them in verse 17, what are you discussing together as you walk along? And then Cleopas responds. And again, sometimes I have to be careful. Maybe I project or I I read myself too much into the response that takes place. But I think in some ways, the response is a little bit sarcastic, right? He, uh, he responds, they stood still with their face downcast and thought, um, and, and the response was, are you the only one living in Jerusalem who doesn't know the things that have happened here in these days? It's like, hello, where have you been? But I think the beautiful thing um, in his, in Cleopas' accusation, or where have you been? Why don't you know what's going on? The, the beautiful irony of it all is that they're the ones that really don't know what's going on, do they? And the one they're talking to knows perfectly well what's going on. So how does Jesus respond? I know um, I have... Uh, a negative tendency at times to be sarcastic in my life, and I know typically my wife's response to my sarcasm is just a gentle, loving reminder, I don't like sarcasm. But so does Jesus sort of, I like to say, give them a smack down and lay it out and rebuke them at that immediate point? No, he lets them speak their hearts. And again, another wonderful reminder to us of how we function, sometimes how we function as humans in the midst of depression or midst of difficult times, the midst of confusion. I mean, often it feels like whenever you try to help some or someone or when someone tries to help you in, in, in difficult times, we are amazingly resourceful in finding reasons not to take the comfort that is offered to us, the comfort that is shared. It's much like the question that Jesus asked of the individual at the, at the pool of Bethsaida whenever they were lying there and he asked, well, um, he couldn't, he explained, I can't get in because by the time I get someone to help me to get into the water, somebody else has already got into the water and, and the idea was that there was healing there. And then Jesus asked a question and I think it ties to this, my point in terms of how we, how we are amazingly resourceful in finding reasons not to take comfort. Jesus asked him a simple question, do you want to be made well? Years ago, I heard that in the context of something I was going through, and I thought, that's sort of an absurd question. Of course you want to be made well. But if we pause sometimes and reflect on the realities of our lives, sometimes we become very complacent and comfortable even in our stuff. Sometimes we get so stuck that... No matter what comes, we see it as bad news. And for these disciples, talking with this stranger on the road to Emmaus, even the notion that they said the tomb was empty, for them the tomb being empty was bad news. But again, the Lord invites our honesty. And so Cleopas responded. He expressed his confusion, his depression, his disillusionment, his shrinking faith, his anger. And we're called to do that to the Lord as well. We're allowed to. We're allowed to express our hearts. And it's the perfect place to go in expressing ourselves to him because he continues to meet us in that. Again, I'll, I'll give a bit of a caveat. I think it's, we got to be careful as well. We just don't go around um, expressing all our thoughts regardless of where we are. And I think especially we have to be careful with people that are young in the faith or people who don't have faith. But he expresses himself. And then how does Jesus respond? He has rebuked them for what he calls their lack of faith. I should uh, be careful. I jumped ahead of myself. I apologize. He responds by teaching, by instructing. And the first part of that is his rebuke. And it's stern for sure. I wouldn't necessarily want to have a rebuke like this. He said, how foolish you are and how slow of heart to believe all that the prophets had spoken. Did not the Christ have to suffer these things and then enter glory? 
I mean, even if he was saying, even if you don't get what's going on right now, don't you remember what you've been taught all these years about what the prophets had proclaimed? <laughs> Again, how much like ourselves, is it not? How we selectively embrace the scriptures that we prefer. I mean, I much rather focus on scriptures that speak about what we get and the benefits and the blessings. The passage I preached this morning from 2 Corinthians wasn't that at all. It talked about all the hardships, the difficulties that are a part of our walk with the Lord in terms of ministry, what he calls us, and living out our faith. But Jesus says, he says, no, that's not what the word said. And then he doesn't leave them there. Again, when every time, when every time somebody, uh, Jesus does this, or I think what scripture calls us to, uh, my mind always jumps to Timothy when it says, all scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, for rebuking, for correcting, and training in righteousness. The whole notion there of the fact that it's, it's God's word we're to use to teach one another. It's God's word that we're used to use to rebuke. And to rebuke, uh, in my mind, is just to tell what is wrong. But we never stop there. Then we use God's word to say what is right to correct the situation, but then we don't stop there either. We take it a step forward, and then we go about that training in righteousness. We walk with the individual in coming, helping them to come to understand what God's word is really teaching and how to live that out. And so Jesus uses the words to teach. He uses the word to explain. And all it tells us is one simple statement in verse 21, 27, pardon me. And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. I've heard different preachers speaking of this, and they say this is one of those sections of scripture that we, they would like to have a little more insight into. Wouldn't it be incredible to hear Jesus proclaiming and, and teaching the Old Testament and how it all talked about him and laying it all out, it would be the wonderful, best commentary you could have on the Old Testament. I mean, the reality was the word of God made flesh was explaining the word, written word of God. It doesn't get any better. So what do we have recorded? Again, we have Jesus, the statement that he simply said, it's all about me. The entire Old Testament, I tell Maranatha, I tell them all the time, the entire Old Testament continues to point forward to Jesus. And even a little further, I won't go there now, but verses 44 to 46, he says that again to his disciples when he met with them a little bit later. And simply puts in Jesus' explanation that he's giving to them, he is saying, understand this. I, Jesus, again, pointing to the Messiah, he says, the Messiah is the divine yes to the Old Testament. He's the yes to all of it. And maybe he said, well, this is how the tabernacle and the temple pointed forward to me. Um, remember the manna? That's how it pointed to me. Remember the bronze serpent? That pointed to me. Maybe he even went to Isaiah 53 and talked to them about the fact of that Messiah, who was, he was uh, that the one who died, Christ died, was numbered with the transgressors. How he was the suffering servant who would die for our sins, then appear alive, triumphant, and reigning. And then maybe even taking a step further, he might have even unpacked Psalm 22, which was a psalm that Jesus made multiple references to there on the cross. Beginning with the words, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And again, I can't help but stop. Maybe I'm more excited about it than, than you are. I don't know. But can you imagine it? The more that Jesus would have opened the word to them, the more I can only imagine their hearts would have raced. He was continuing, taking the negative, the suffering and death of the cross and showing these two individuals that it wasn't an obstacle to him being the Messiah, but they were essential for him being the Messiah. It's incredible truth for them and for us. And I think when we look to God's word, when we study God's word, when we read God's word, when we know God's word, we can be spared much in life. Not that all our problems are going to go away, but we will learn and see how we can navigate them in wisdom and in his truth. Because the Bible doesn't fail us. 
problem is we don't know it well enough. I don't know it well enough. And we can't be comforted by what we don't know. So we need to keep reading it. We, and we need to keep reading it always with an eye to our Savior. Because again, as I had just said, everything to do with our salvation and our peace is yes in Jesus Christ. So he explains to them who that Messiah was and what happened as it was unpacked in, in, in the prophets and, and the law. And then the last bit of his explanation or, or his instruction to them was revelation. Again, Jesus unpacks that. And how do they respond after him teaching all us? You got to stay with us. No, it's too late for you to continue to go. Stay with us. And so again, he was urged to stay. And that idea of urging him to stay carries the idea of force in a sense. And of course, you can understand why they wanted him to stay, not only for his protection, but why not want more of what they just had, right? And of course, it was good because the text continues saying that as they gathered around the table, Jesus took the bread, he blessed it, he broke it, and he gave it to them, and their eyes were opened. Can you imagine the joy of that revelation? Easter morning, we say, Christ is risen. And then we say in response, he is risen indeed. Can you imagine at that moment in time? That, yes. And then he's gone. In a blink of an eye. But something remains. Easter fire. Their hearts were burning within them. I think that's what we need to remember happens when the word comes alive within us. And so, what do they do? It's the last part. Remember I said there's confusion, there's instruction, and then there's witness. They go the whole way back to Jerusalem. Again, maybe for some, seven miles isn't that big of a deal. Before my... Uh, my my arthritic knee began to act up. Seven miles would be a, a nice, well, it would be a good journey for sure, but it would be something I would be more than happy to endeavor. But again, at this time of the day, the day is done. They're there for supper by heading back. Again, people of that, that era, that area knew very well that you don't travel those lonely ro the roads at night because of the fear of thieves and muggers. But they couldn't keep it to themselves. It was a little bit corny on the next line, but you could say it was the beginning of the fellowship of the burning hearts as opposed to the fellowship of the ring. Sorry, Lord of the Rings fan. But there were a band of witnesses, of witnesses of Christ to the entire world. That's the picture. That's what we see in this account on that later in that same day on Easter Sunday. But the truth of what was, was revealed and understood for these two individuals on the road, communicated later to the other disciples, was that Jesus knows where we are as well. He knows the geography of our lives, both the outside, where we're located, that sort of thing, but he knows the geography of our heart on the inside as well. And not only that, he knows the temperature of our souls. Whether it's on fire or ice or lukewarm. But I want to encourage you this evening, be comforted in the fact that his method is still the same. He meets us where we are with his word. And understand, in meeting us where we are with his word, his desire is to bring fire to our cold hearts. Let's pray. Lord, thank you so much for your word. And Lord, for the way it proclaims your truth it reveals your heart for us. And it just continues to 
give comfort and assurance in the midst of, at times, our lostness. Thank you so much, Lord, for pursuing me, for pursuing us, for showing us our need and the great and the perfect provision in Jesus Christ. Thank you. And thank you, Lord, that we can now, we can use these truths to continue to impress them upon the hearts of others. And Lord, even as we give testimony to a few minutes ago in the uh, sacrament of baptism, that we are committed to one another as brothers and sisters in faith to continue to impress these truths on each other, on our children, to help them see and know who you are and the incredible gift and the needed gift of Jesus Christ in our lives. Thank you. We pray it in Christ's name. Amen. We have the opportunity now to, to sing together in response in Christ alone. So as we go from this place this evening into the week that lies before us, we are reminded that as we go, we go to serve. And the wonderful prophet, the words from the prophet Micah remind us that God has shown us what is good. And what does the Lord require of you? What does the Lord call for us to do, empower us to do, but to act justly, to love mercy, and to walk, hum walk humbly 
with our God. And again, as I said, he blesses us to do that and receive his blessing as we go. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and fill you with grace. May the Lord turn his countenance towards you and fill you with his shalom, his peace. Amen.